In the early hours of the morning of the 30th of May, 1832, a gunshot was heard ringing out across the fields in the 13th arrondissement in Paris. A peasant who heard the shot ran towards where the sound came from, and on the ground he found a young man writhing in agony. His name was Everest Galois, a well-known revolutionary at the time. He'd obviously been shot by a dueling wound. He was taken to the local Cochin Hospital, where he died the next day in the arms of his brother. The last words he said were, Do not cry, he pleaded. It takes all my courage to die at the age of 20. But it isn't for contributions to revolutionary politics that we remember Galois. The young revolutionary had stayed up the whole previous night trying to articulate a new theory, a revolutionary theory in mathematics that he developed. Maybe it was the lack of sleep which contributed to his terrible shot that morning. But in that package that he left behind was the beginnings of a new language called group theory, which would finally help mathematicians to articulate one of the most important concepts in the whole of nature, namely symmetry. And it's for helping to complete an epic saga written in this language that John Thompson and Jacques Titz are being rewarded with this year's Arbel Prize. Symmetry is a central concept in science and the arts. In science, it helps us to explain the behavior of molecules, viruses, crystals. It's an important indication of good gene structure. It's helped us to understand the fundamental particles of nature. It's also important in technology as well. The codes that are used to encode digital data use symmetry to keep this data, in, uh, the, the integrity of this data. For artists too, symmetry has always been important and underlies many of the different arts, from music to poetry, from architecture to painting. Also in the games that we play, from the ancient game of Ur found in Babylon in 2500 BC, played with symmetrical tetrahedral dice, through to the modern Hungarian Rubik's Cube, symmetry underlies many of these games. But it's only in the 19th century that we finally had a language to be able to really answer uh, the question, what is symmetry? The saga begins with an extraordinary revelation contained in Galois' manuscripts that just as molecules can be decomposed into atomic atoms, things like hydrogen and oxygen, just in the same way that numbers can be broken down to indivisible primes, Galois realized that symmetry as well, symmetrical objects can be broken down into indivisible symmetrical objects, so-called simple groups. These symmetrical objects are the atoms of the world of symmetry. Galois' breakthrough made us realize that mathematicians could produce a periodic table of symmetry which would be as influential as the periodic table has been to the chemists. And prime numbers are actually at the heart of the first of the building blocks in this classification of symmetry. For example, if I take a 15-sided figure, the symmetries of this figure, well, symmetries for a mathematician are the ways that I can pick this object up, turn it in some way, and place it back down on an image so it looks like the shape hasn't moved at all. So for example, I could pick up this shape, turn it by a fifteenth of a turn, put it down again, and the shape looks like it did when I started. But the symmetries of this 15-sided figure can be built out of the symmetries of a pentagon sitting inside it and a triangle. These are the building blocks of the symmetries of the 15-sided figure. Why? Well, because 15 can be broken out down into 3 times 5, this is at the heart of why the symmetries of this object can also be built out of the pentagon and the triangle. For example, if I want to move the green dot around to the yellow dot by a 15th of a turn, how can I use the symmetries of a pentagon? Well, I turn the pentagon by 2 fifths of a turn, which takes the green dot all the way around to the blue dot. Now I use the triangle to make a third of a turn backwards to pull the combination of these two dots all the way back around to the yellow dot. So the combinations of the symmetries of the pentagon and the triangle can be used to build the symmetries of the 15-sided figure. And the reason this is true is because 1 over 15 is equal to 2 fifths minus 1 third. So the symmetries of prime-sided figures are the first building blocks, the first atoms in this periodic table of symmetry. And it's one of the achievements that John Thompson is being recognized for, for the Arbel Prize, 
that these building blocks help you to build many of the symmetrical objects in the mathematical world. He proved with Walter Feitz, the late Walter Feitz, that if an object or a structure has an odd number of symmetries, then that symmetry can be broken down into these prime-sided symmetries. So the symmetries of an object with an odd number of symmetries are built out of these indivisible prime-sided figures. It was an amazing theorem. It first, it was a, a theorem which made us realize we had the possibility actually to start to classify the building blocks of symmetry. It was an epic theorem in other ways as well. It ran to 255 pages and it took up the whole of the Pacific Journal of Mathematics in 1963 possibly was the longest proof at that time ever written in the history of mathematics. Now, although Thomson's work revealed that these prime-sided figures are the heart of many of the symmetrical shapes in the mathematical world, not all shapes could be broken down into these prime-sided shapes. Take, for example, the humble football. Football, the classic football, is made out of pentagons and hexagons. Now, the symmetries of this figure, the ways that I can move the shape, such as the pentagons and hexagons realign in the same way, you find that there are 60 rotational symmetries that I can make of the football. Now, 60 is an even number, so Thompson and Feit's theorem doesn't apply to this shape. But maybe there's another way to break this down into symmetries of these prime-sided shapes. Now, 60 is a very divisible number. It's one of the reasons that the Babylonians chose it for their number, for their base for their number system. It's also the reason we have 60 minutes in the hour. But despite the fact that 60 is an incredibly divisible number, Galois was able to prove that the symmetries of this shape, the 60 rotational symmetries, are as indivisible as if it was a prime-sided shape. So this turns out, the symmetries of the football turn out to be one of the new indivisible symmetries in this periodic table of symmetry. And it turned out to just to be the tip of the iceberg. But if we need to see some of the other shapes that are on, the list, on this list, we have to move from the three-dimensional world to the world of hyperspace. And we have to look at symmetries of objects in higher dimensions. And it turns out that the symmetries of hypercubes actually help us to see some of more of these symmetries in the periodic table. So what does a mathematician mean when I say a cube in four dimensions. How do I see a cube in four dimensions? Well, if any of you have used a map to come here to the Norwegian Academy, you've used a language, maybe, which helps to translate geometry into numbers. And this language, developed by Descartes in the 17th century, produces a wonderful dictionary to change shapes into numbers. So, for example, a stat nav will tell you that the location of the Norwegian Academy here in Oslo, you take 10.7 steps east, and 55.9 steps north, and you will arrive here at the Norwegian Academy. And so we can change any position on the Earth into two numbers. So position, space being changed into coordinates, numbers which identify the place on the Earth. If I want to identify my place in space, I might need three coordinates to identify it. So these coordinates help you to change geometry into numbers. So for example, a square, I can translate into numbers by identifying the coordinates at the corners of the square. So we have Greenwich down at zero, zero, the corner of the square. And if I move one step east, one step north, or one step east and north, I will identify the four corners of the square. So I've changed the square into four pairs of numbers which identify the square. Shapes into numbers. Three dimensions. Well, now I need three coordinates to keep track of north, east, and also up, some, some up direction. So there I can translate the cube into starting at 0, 0, 0, all the way through to the extremal point at 1, 1, 1. Now, the shapes run out, unfortunately. The pictures run out, but the numbers don't. And this, this dictionary of Descartes enables me to actually conjure up a four-dimensional cube. It's described by four numbers starting at 0, 0, 0, 0, and the extremal point of the hypercube is at 1, 1, 1, 1. And using this language of numbers, I can tell you that a hypercube has 16 corners, 32 edges, 24 square faces, and is built out of eight cubes. And using this language, I can explore the symmetries of these objects. Now, we can actually see shadows of these shapes 
If anyone's been to the Arch at La Défense in Paris, you will, seen, will have seen a shadow of a four-dimensional cube. Just in the same way as the artist to represent a three-dimensional cube on a two-dimensional canvas will draw a square inside a square and join up the edges, the architect at La Défense, to represent the shadow of a four-dimensional cube, has put a three-dimensional cube inside a larger three-dimensional cube, and this is, in fact, a shadow of this shape. But to really explore the symmetries of these objects, you really need this language of numbers to be able to do it. Now, the symmetries of these hypercubes turned out to be the building blocks of some of the new indivisible shapes. And these were actually called Lie groups, named after a Norwegian mathematician, Sophus Lee, who began his investigation of these groups actually in prison in France after he'd been mistakenly arrested as a spy during the Franco-Prussian War. Now, the symmetries of these hypercubes in higher dimensions turned out to be just one of a 16 new families of Lie groups. And it's for unlocking the secrets of these groups for which the Belgian mathematician Jacques Titz is being recognized with the award of the Arbel Prize. Titz constructed geometrical settings, things he called buildings, in higher dimensions, which help explain the symmetries of these new families. Now, the periodic table of symmetry seemed to be shaping up very nicely, except there were five strange symmetrical shapes that had been discovered by a French mathematician called Emile Mathieu that didn't seem to fit into any of these patterns of nice families of groups that have been disco discovered up to this point. They seem to be little, like, little orphans sitting there without any families. One of these symmetrical objects you can, in fact, listen to. It is at the heart of a piece of music written by Messiaen called Il de Faux II. And the two themes that he used, if you translate them into mathematical symmetries, actually generate one of these objects, these strange objects, which we call a sporadic group. It's actually called M12. So here's a, a symmetrical serenade to celebrate our Arbel laureates this morning. So it certainly sounds rather sporadic, and that is one of the five sporadic groups that Emile Mathieu came up with. But are there any more? Well, in 1965, John Thompson received a letter from a Croatian mathematician called Janko claiming to discover a new indivisible symmetry, a sixth sporadic group. At first, John Thompson was a little dismissive of the claim, but as he analyzed Janko's proposal, he realized that Croatian, Croatian could be onto something. Yanko's discovery turned out to be the beginning of a crazy period in the story of symmetry where mathematicians discovered a whole range of strange, indivisible, sporadic groups of symmetry that didn't seem to fit into any of the patterns of previous generations. Now, many of these discoveries depended on a formula developed by John Thompson, which helped you to predict whether there would be one of these sporadic groups out there. Often the birth of these sporadic groups mirrored, in some sense, the discoveries of fundamental particles. Often the physics would predict there would be a particle there before you actually observed it. And in the same way, this formula that Thompson developed was used to say, for example, there might be a symmetrical object indivisible with 604,800 symmetries before it was actually constructed. The construction would then often depend on finding the right geometric setting to be able to realize that number of symmetries. And both Thompson and Titz are amongst those who have their names attached to some of these new sporadic groups of symmetries that appeared over the decades since Yanko's discovery in 1965. The culmination of this period of investigation was the discovery of a 26th sporadic group called the Monster, which is like a snowflake which only appears when you move to 196,883 dimensional space. Suddenly, this strange object appears whose symmetries have more symmetries than there are atoms in the sun, yet is as indivisible as if it was a prime-sided shape, and it doesn't seem to fit into any patterns at all. But this 26th sporadic group turned out to be the last of these groups. And we're now coming to the realization that maybe we have a complete list of all the building blocks of symmetry. They're contained in a wonderful thing we call the Atlas of Finite Simple Groups. This is our periodic table of symmetry. 
And it's thanks to the work of our Nobel Arbel laureates this morning, John Thompson and Jacques Tits, that we were able to complete this building blocks of symmetry. Perhaps one of the greatest achievements of the 20th century. And now it's up to the next generation of mathematicians to see what we can build with these building blocks in this periodic table. Thank you.